When I was working with Ice-T, he said to me, Doug, a great man once said, no, no man can be great alone unless other people of stature speak of, of him in high regard. Like Al Capone ran Chicago and you couldn't convict him because he decided who was the mayor. So in a way, it's this, I can get away with anything. And that's maybe what gets, gets him off, is that idea that I'm above it. I'm above everything. Try to get me. I'm Nicola Talent, and you're listening to Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the sins of the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. When federal agents with U.S. Homeland Security raided two of rapper Sean Diddy Combs' mansions in L.A. and Miami, his career at the top of the hip hop scene began to collapse. The artist formerly known as Puff Daddy and P. Diddy, amongst other names, is now facing multiple civil lawsuits accusing him of sex trafficking, sexual abuse and rape. So what is the background of billionaire Combs and could he be the next Harvey Weinstein or Jeffrey Epstein? Today I'm talking to journalist Douglas Century, an author and expert on the hip hop scene, about the story that has gripped America. This is Crime World, a podcast from sundayworld.com. Well, what I wanted to ask you, first of all, is when do Homeland Security come for you? Why would Homeland Security be coming to your door? In this case, obviously, uh, you know, Mr. P. Diddy, Pup Daddy. Doctor, is that uh, brother, indi- brother Love. <laughs> brother Love. Brother is love that an sense. indication of something outside these civil proceedings we've been reading about? Is it a is it a bigger investigation? Well, from my understanding, uh, this is what happened to R. Kelly. Uh, Homeland Security is involved when it is the trafficking, se- sexual trafficking. Um, you know, it, it can be confusing because those could be local cases too. But I, my understanding is the reason it wasn't just the FBI or if it was drugs, it would be DEA. I think it was the interstate or the... Also, he was taking them, apparently, if he did have these parties on on an island. So the Homeland Security part is 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 uh, an aspect of the allegations of sexual trafficking of minors, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm sure that they were also involved with R. Kelly. So it's kind of following that same blueprint of R. Kelly had been civilly sued, admitted to some things, and then then they came and got him and he kept tapes. And is it kind of also you know, in the sort of the the regions of the Epstein, maybe when there's a lot of allegations being made, not just one. Oh my gosh. Yeah, they're likening it to the, you know, the hip hop Epstein, partly also because of the circle of power around him. I mean, the kind of people, the Democratic Party donors, the, you know, who who has he not hung out with and partied with? Now you're starting to see this funny, you know, certain celebrities saying, you know, I've partied with Puffy, but I don't stay for the party party. Like there's the kind of, you know, no, eh, eh, you know, it's, it's, what's the aphorism where there's smoke, there's fire. You don't want to yeah. believe an allegation that sounds too crazy. But when so many people are now coming out and saying, well, you know, there's freaky stuff going on. And, you know, look, I mean, between consent, consenting adults, I don't see that, but I, apparently it's, it's the aspect of, um, of the minors. Tra- Miners and also, if you remember, he had this this girl group, uh, Danity Kane, that he had to, it was quite popular in the States. Uh, I don't know if it got onto MTV Europe. Back when MTV did, you know, program, <laughs> right? And making of the band, and he made this band, Danity Kane. And one of the girls came out and said, I mean, a grown woman, that he was, you know, going to pimp her out to all the guys in the industry. And, and she refused. So that was mm-hmm. another allegation. So I don't think it's just only the minors. It's, I mean, you, you, trafficking in women as well i mean this is and it's and also drugs i mean there's a lot of this pink first time i ever heard of pink cocaine did you hear about that yeah i've heard of pink cocaine but (laughs) well he had he had a people running around with satchels at his parties or fanny packs remember those things and you know you could have your ecstasy you could have this and then i said pink cocaine is not actually cocaine it's some kind of mixture of mdma with ketamine and i mean they were partying with all kinds of drugs it sounds like so, Douglas, what age is he now? About 57. Should he not have settled down a little bit? He's 54. But, He's you know, 54. these guys these guys lie. Like, Jay-Z subtra- subtracts from his... I When I moved to New York, he was... Th- and I was a, on a university student. He was throwing these parties that were... It was called Daddy's House at... Remember the days of big discos, big, big clubs? Yeah. Uh, and 
he might be a couple years younger than me. His listed age is 54. And that might be documented. I don't know. But uh, should he have not? Yeah, you'd think he was uh, an old enough man with a bunch of children and responsibilities. But um is the likes smack- of these wild parties, I suppose, that, that he hosts and he seems to be famed for having. Uh, he it's, certainly it's, hasn't. It just it smacks to me of, you know, if you look at Greek Greek tragedy and everybody's got a fatal flaw, this just just narcissism, megalomania, you know, and, and this is the thing. He has mm-hmm. gotten away with so much um, dirt over the years. I mean, okay, there was the shooting with Jennifer Lopez. You know, he got his, everybody says he shot one of the guns and wounded this woman. He got away with that one. He got away with a stampede. I think I told you when I first moved to New York, they, uh, wonderful rapper, Heavy D and, and Puff Daddy, they, they had this celebrity basketball game at City College, overbooked it by far. And there was a stampede that killed many people. There were lots of civil lawsuits that he settled. So he paid off the families of the victims and said, you know, I admit wrongdoing, but somehow he didn't go to jail for that. So I don't I don't know what goes through the brain of somebody that wealthy um, who gets away with it so many times. And uh, this shooting with Jennifer Lopez you're talking about happened in a Manhattan nightclub in 99. Yeah, at which I point that one. <laughs> he was nearly a decade, uh, you know, into Bad Boy Records, which he'd founded in 1990. He was very rich, very famous. He'd changed his name within about two years of that to P. Diddy. This was all... Yeah. I can't keep up with the names with them, by the way. He's sort of changed his name. So he many changes times. them. He, he changes them because it's a uh, rebranding. You know, Puff yeah. Daddy was involved in the shooting. So then he became Diddy. And then now, now he's brother love or whatever strange thing. But yes, that, that was 2000 at a place called Club New York, right in the middle of it's Times Square. And I was assigned to cover that one. And it was crazy because they had J Lo and she was, remember, she was this up and coming actress. Uh, she was wearing a re- very revealing green. Uh, I remember what she was arrested in, and they they had her like handcuffed to the radio to the to the precinct uh, pole or something, and she was crying. And her mother shows up, and he starts yelling at her in Spanish. I told you not to mess with this guy. Uh, no one, no one really knew. And I have to, you know, without name dropping, full disclosure. I was around them. I was in a booth in this club in a banquet, I was writing a story for the New York times and it was the craziest situation. I was with, I was covering this girl, a woman uh, who's a VJ for MTV and she was with Prince, believe this. And so in one banquet, it became, it was Prince and then uh, Puffy and JLo showed up and then Mike Tyson. And I forget what, so we're all in this. And then I remember, uh, the crush of people. This was like the VIP within the VIP. And who am I? I'm just sitting there like the reporter guy. Um, but I always wondered what she saw in him. I, th- I felt like it was almost a marriage of uh, I'll help your. See, she was trying to really get bigger in the uh, the entertainment world and he did help her. But they For didn't sure, seem yeah. like a, I mean, Ben Affleck seems more like her type. <laughs> but he was basically he started out as a rapper and he was working for a music company before he set up his own. Um, so he started off as a backup dancer, dancer, and then back in the days of artisan repertoire, A and R men. See, now the music industry has completely changed. People can just make themselves superstars on YouTube, but mm-hmm. there were very powerful people within record companies. And this was Uptown Records. His his uh, his mentor was a guy named Andre Harrell. And no, Puffy was never known as a rapper. He's wanted desperately to be that. He's not very good, <laughs> but he's a good dancer. And he got his own deal. And he, his first artist was a guy named Craig Mack. And then he had, dis- you know, his claim to fame was having discovered Notorious B.I.G. Biggie. Uh, and then they, but almost everybody who is alive, who has worked with him, this rapper Mace, they all ended on bad terms. You can't find a person who worked at that label who felt they were paid their their proper publishing rights. Uh, so, you know, like Ice-T said to me, when I was working with Ice-T, he said to me, Doug, a great man once said, no no man can be great uh, alone unless other people of stature speak of, of him in high regard. Well, Puffy's kind of the opposite. I can't find too many people who've worked with him who say, yeah, he was a great guy to work with. You know, it seems like there's just this trail of tragedy and or bad feelings. And uh, I'm not saying he's a ripoff artist, but I got disgusted by him when, when B.I.G. died. If you remember, that was a big day in hip hop, 97. 
he had a number one hit. It was called I'll Be Missing You. He took the, the police song, Every Breath You Take. And it was just this prayer like, and I thought, this is so tawdry. It's such a, I just, I, I saw through it as like a uh, gross capitalization on grief. Like, I, it just almost felt like, because, you know, already there were rumors that he had his his artist set up, you know, like he was part of that whole, well, he certainly created the circumstances with Suge Knight that led to, led to a lot of the violence. But yeah, then, then he releases this song that to me is just the most, you know, it's how uh, you put out a record that's mourning your, your best friend. And, you know, it's just, I don't even know if any of it was sincere at all, you know. But yeah, so the, he was the very rumors... powerful during that time of the 1990s for that decade. He discovered the notorious B.I.G., Mary J. Bly, Usher, went on to discover them. So he's a very powerful individual. And I suppose um, people do want to be near him and want to be with him and see him with him, the likes of Jennifer Lopez when that gunfight yeah. happens in Manhattan. She chose, she was on the, the cusp of becoming such a famous clean cut girl, really. But being with him is all part of that celebrity scene. Yeah. And, I, you know, he did a couple other things you have to remember. It's, you know, our, our world has changed so fast. You and I remember the 90s and the days of CDs. And But, yes, he, he his claim to fame was he discovered artists. Now, Suge Knight, remember when this East Coast, West Coast thing happened, there was a very famous Source Awards. And Suge Knight had the rival label, you know, with Tupac and, and Snoop Dogg. And in New York, in front of the whole crowd and referring specifically to Puff Daddy, he says, any of you artists that want to, don't want your executive producer all up dancing in the videos, you know, all rapping on your records, come to death row. Like, I'm just the executive. That's the guy that he wants to be the star and get all the, but he also, you know, he, he did a couple other things that were smart. He, he created his label, Sean John. I mean, there was this Vogue for a while of like, hip, I'm sure it was big in Europe too, like hip hop clothing, you know? So he got that into Macy's. Then um, of course he had his Ciroc, vodka deal which i think he just extricated himself from but um he's been very good at sort of um spotting a trend and mm. capitalizing on it but yeah moths to a flame you know or you know, what what is it like there's a like i said i've been around him um there's a there's a weird i don't want to sound spiritual it's kind of a dark energy <laughs> i i i perceive some <laughs> I don't how, how can I tell the story? You can use it or not. A very well known. So while I was around uh, the circle and I was around him a bit, I can't say we really talked much or anything. But this very well known African American actor. This was when Puff Daddy was trying to become an actor, a movie star. And I think he had a deal. I think he might have been in a few movies. You know how Puffy always wears glasses. He's always wearing sunglasses. Mm -hmm. It could be because he's stoned, but you never know. But this very well known African American actor, knowing I'm a reporter for the New York Times, he said it just off the cup, and he he goes, you know. Puff will never be an actor. And I said, what do you mean? Why not? And he goes, his eyes, they're dead. He just, he did like this, like there's no emotion in his eyes. And there is that, like it, he just got this flatness. I said this to somebody, I said, it's almost like there's just this, and as the guy said, uh, psychopathy. Yeah. You know, I don't know. Yeah. But no, there's, there is, there's a romance. So he used to throw these really elegant, it was called the white party. Everybody had to dress in white, go out to the Hamptons. He was definitely part of that. Um, he allowed the sort of white socialite girls, the Paris Hiltons and all that to be around the danger of hip hop without really being around what they've perceived to be street thugs. Mm -hmm. You know, even though, I mean, look, you know, and let's not, you don't have to do too much research into him to understand. He's not a middle, he did go to kind of a middle-class high school and play football, but his dad was a gangster. His dad was a hustler in Harlem mixed up in that whole, if you ever saw the movie American Gangster with Denzel Washington, that Frank Lucas, I guess his dad was kind of an associate of it and his dad was murdered. So he comes from a street world. And I think mm -hmm. he's, um, I think he's cunning. I but think as he's a human a being, he's somebody who it seems to me that sometimes, you know, people reach for stardom, for celebrity. And the few that actually really get there, once they get there, everything they touch turns to gold. So he had, as you pointed out, his clothing label. You know, he reinvented himself a number of times. He discovered um, artists, but he also then made music himself and, you know, went to move to into making movies. And he might have been not particularly good at any of this stuff, 
but it made him incredibly wealthy. And that fame came with even more fame. I think by yeah. 2022, um, when his seventh child was born with a variety of different women, but he has these children, he was listed by Forbes as being worth a billion dollars. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the first three, if you look at the hip hop world, I mean, we can look at what well, they usually talk about uh, uh, Jay Z, Dr. Dre, uh, Puffy. There may be others, but they, they've hit the, the the B. They've hit the one B mark, uh, which is unusual. I mean, these are street guys, but Jay Z is one of the best rappers. You know, you can like his style or not, but he's definitely in the top. Uh, Dr. Dre, an absolutely genius producer. Puffy, what is he known for? So the thing is, he was he has a lot of production credits. The word in the industry, almost every he has young, young, brilliant people doing the beat. He takes the credit. He'll say that was my beat, but so they they kind of dif- differentiate between the beat maker, the person who's actually coming up with the beat, and then the person who takes the credit for the production. But yeah, I think a, a guy with a, a modicum of talent, <laughs> like he's not a genius rapper, like like Jay Z, and he's not a brilliant producer. Or look, I'm wearing these headphones that Dr. Dre sold for a billion dollars. Fifty Cent's another one who I think almost got to the billion mark with uh, Vitamin Water. Um, I think Puffy has taken a brand. He's made himself a brand, and he made that brand very successful. And sure, yeah, he sure knew how to partner. Now I don't know. All those partnerships seem to be running away. Like I don't know anybody that's. Uh, he severed his deal with the the vodka, the Ciroc. He sold it back or something, but. Um, I People think there's going to be a. From this now. Oh yeah, I can't imagine yeah. there's anybody. I mean, I don't know if it, so. If let's it's talk a... about what what's happening because from what I could see, that now maybe there's been a lot of complaints made over the years, and they have been silenced and and settled, and I'm sure all of that will probably come to light. But what I could see that one certainly filed the first one was in 2017 when a chef said she'd been sexually harassed. He had been sexually harassed. Sorry, that was yeah. a man. Yeah. Um, and that was settled, right? And then in 2023, an ex-partner of his, who he does have children with, I think, uh, that he had the long-term relationship with, she makes more serious claims. Um, what's her name again, Douglas? I had it there. Uh, well, Ventura. not important. Not Kim. Oh, 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 you're talking about Jesse. I'm talking about yeah. What's the what's her name? Jesse Ventura. Is Jessie. it? She she recorded as Jesse. Yeah, yeah. And okay. she said he would be he would beat her up. Um, and J Lo has given interviews about the a year or two she spent with him, where she said, you know, he, she just implied that there was violence. It was it's yeah. pretty clear reading between the lines. So yeah, it's been coming out pretty frequently that uh, sexual harassment. You know, this is before Me Too, right? So I think... So you know, sorry, Russell's... 2023, I'm actually talking about Cassandra Posse Ventura. Uh, Cassie, she, fi- she filed this, uh, this claim in 2023, and she said he raped her back in 2018, yeah. and that she had been sort of... There was a pattern of abuse from when she first started working with him back in 2005. Um, and she says at that point she was only 19, and it was a much older man. But she settles this claim within a day of making it. So she goes to the courts and makes this claim and bang, it's settled. We don't know what came of it and we probably don't really know what was in it. Well, that's so if you want to understand, yes, there were probably lots of allegations over the years and they really didn't escalate to this point. What happened? It was was it November of 2023. It was just a few months ago. And her her claims were so explosive and it was within 24 hours. He had settled that was the straw that broke the camel's back because then this producer, Little Rod, you'll probably get to him. He uh, Then the floodgates opened, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, I think the fact that he settled that so quickly, I mean, you, you tend to think if, and they were pretty horrendous allegations, you know, beating up a woman and and and, and sexually controlling her. And he, he used to make her, uh, this, this, you know, get into this. It's a crime show. They were called freak offs. He would he would have male porn stars come. Apparently, that was his thing. For his voyeuristic pleasure, she would have to do stuff with. That's what that was her his allegation. Now okay. that's not true. Don't don't you counter sue for defamation? I mean, if somebody yeah. really you know, it's very hard to see settling something 
that egregious if you unless you just want it to go away uh and then uh, you know this so this then this little rod another producer he says he was sexually uh, uh, molested the pattern is it seems like puffy likes sex workers who are of both genders he seems to like to have parties and it seems to be his thing that he likes to get the woman he's in a relationship with to do things and it seems that's his mm. that's what that's what uh, sorry i called her jesse cassie said that's how he gets off he he d- would just watch you know pleasure himself as i had to perform with these male porn stars and he was you know and there's some uh, threats and intimidation presumably going with that to create the crime because in this case we are talking about there's no suggestion there's anybody underage in this scenario no, but he had the control over her career. So I think at one point it was something like, you know, your album's not going to come out or, you know, I'm not putting that single out. He had come, you know, it's, it's a power dynamic. I mean, thank God we've, we've passed the me too thing where people are realizing you don't really have to physically threaten somebody, you know, the glass ceiling women have had to deal with. So here's a guy that, you know, yeah, he had all the strings. What's making this interesting and hip hop is extremely homophobic, but is that the amount of men that are coming out and saying, yeah, <laughs> You know, and it's almost so in a strange way, I'm watching this going, that's that's become like he's rumored to have been with Usher. You know, he groomed. So he's he now is being accused of having groomed uh, Usher, who's now in his 30s, because somebody leaked this blind item saying which, you know, so and so um, he slept with uh, someone who performed at the Super Bowl. Well, this year that was Usher. Uh, and another a rapper from Philadelphia who had been dating Nicki Minaj, that's Meek Mill. So everybody could read between the lines. And Usher has given interviews like to Howard Stern saying, yeah, I was like 14 or very young living at Puffy's house. He says, man, did I see some things? And then young Justin Bieber apparently was like, it's so funny how you go back and look at these videos now and you see these interviews and you say, that really looks sketchy. You know, a grown man with a 13 year old saying, you know, it's... Um, so there's little vibes of Michael Jackson a bit. There's vibes of our very much of, of Harvey Weinstein and that whole industry yeah. thing, you know, and I suppose the power he had within that industry to make or break a career um, and the floodgates open as people start coming and they see maybe perhaps a settlement or they feel strength in numbers. Um, and he has said nothing. Uh, no, yeah, he was uh, videotaped dancing and smoking a cigar in his Miami. I mean, look, they got him. His his jet was about to leave. They swept down. <laughs> it's, it's, this would make a great movie at some point. Or great, you, you, you'd make a great uh, a true crime documentary about this. This this white boy, this beautiful, like just you know, clean cut American. He was, I guess, a basketball player at Syracuse University, and he's the drug mule. Uh, you know, he looked like he was about 18, but I guess he's 24. And he was about to get on the plane with all these drugs. And they swept down. He's got this beautiful G Gulfstream 5. It's all black. Um, and they, I think they got him thinking he was about to leave, you know. So all, no, he said nothing. He's just, I think he, po- wait, wait. I think he posted something on Instagram, but it was not about these allegations. It was, uh, oh, it was a picture of his newborn daughter. Mm-hmm. who was in pink and he said something like you know happy birthday baby girl or something you know he's trying to put out the, you know when you said he's 54 isn't he old enough to know better you know you mentioned weinstein you know i think he was schooled and came up under this era of not just music people but mm-hmm. film people where the casting couch the all powerful executive and these were his role models i mean people they all aspired to being i mean harvard weinstein you know remember shakespeare in love and the and the uh i mean everything Miramax did was gold. I mean, they were Oscar and now he's just a disgrace. Right. So I think that Puffy probably aspired to being one of these old school moguls and those moguls didn't have any scruples. As far as I know, they put you, they, you know, they put the starlet in the next big movie. If she would sleep with him, uh, they could make or break your career. You know, they had, Oh, I have compromising photos of you, rock Hudson. You're gay. If you don't do what I say, you know, it was cutthroat. And I think he came up in that entertainment, which now with social media and it's, it's so hard to live, you know, whatever Shakespeare said about what, what's a, what's dark, what goes down the darkness will come out in the light or, you know, you can't do that anymore. We can't have yeah. any secrets, right? Everything's being videotaped. But I think, so I think if I were to speculate on his 
psychology is that he came of age where that was the all-powerful guy. You got away with it. You could pay people off to shut up. And, you know, I think, Ar- I mean, nobody saw this happen in R. Kelly either. Uh, Weinstein, I couldn't have imagined that the amount of people that have done such egregious th- stuff and you thought, how did they think they would get away with that? Well, because they did. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a bit like our our um, drug traffickers, isn't it? And our OCGs. Yeah. It's the same thing. How did they think they could get away with it? I think the longer they exist and they do get away with it, the more powerful they feel they are. Um, and those around them see them getting away with it. And there's a reality to that for those around them. Um, and that increases the, the level of fear they have. And, and, you know, they're looking at this incredibly powerful person who seems to be beating literally the system and the law um one thing that came out with the j-lo trial uh he beat that case you know and but his he made his artist a very a really wonderful uh rapper named shine he's now in he's belizean and he's in the he's in the government in belize he got out of the record a lot of these people just get out of the record business but he he went to prison for 10 years for that shooting but there's a woman who said no i saw puff daddy literally pull out his gun and he shot me in the face uh, apparently he told this little raw, this producer, oh no, I paid off. I bribed those jurors, you know, that he fixed the jury. And he was, right. he, he's, you don't know if it's true. He's bragging about yeah. it, but that's like, that's the Al Capone model, right? Like Al Capone ran Chicago and you couldn't convict him because, you know, he could, he could, he decided who was the mayor. So in a way it's this, yeah, I can get away with anything. And that's maybe what gets, gets him off is that idea that I'm above it. I'm above everything. Try to get me. Catch me if but you I think can. Then, yeah. when when what you see is when these floodgates open, and when the information starts to come, and people start to get confidence, as we're seeing, I think there's five uh, civil cases where uh, I think there was a fifth lawsuit filed against him in February, which is the um, the Ro- Lil Rod Jones one. But up to yeah. that, there was two two suits filed in the days after. The first one with Cassie, Cassandra, Cassie Ventura was was settled. So there was two literally filed within a few days of that. There was another one filed in December, and there's been another one filed on in February 2020. And there will and there will be more. There will be more. Uh, I'm sure. And from, from what I can understand, Homeland Security raids on his two properties are probably from a completely separate criminal investigation to those uh filings. Well, what Little Rod said in some of his, uh, in, in that um, lawsuit, there were allegations of criminality that included sex trafficking. Um, mm-hmm. It's weird, the sex workers. So <laughs> he's at war with 50 Cent and he are at war, partly because the mother of 50 Cent's child, it's come out, is a sex worker. He <laughs> said, like, it's a sex worker. Right. I didn't realize the sex child, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sex sex working is not illegal in Miami, apparently. I didn't realize that. So he had he would have these um his underlings, like Lerada, looking for, you know, well-endowed men to come to his parties, et cetera, et cetera. All of this. So I think more of this is going to come out in terms of And do you uh, think that statement, that filing from uh Lil Rod Jones is enough to send Homeland Security in the way they did on I think that there were I think that there was evidence within all these lawsuits, which look, you just, you, you can't stage a raid like that on, you know, flimsy allegations. My understanding is they had a lo- They then sat down law enforcement, American law enforcement feds, whether it was a Homeland security, D- uh, FBI sat down with probably the same people. We don't know. And got statements and got, you know, if you raid his house, you'll find these guns. If you raid his house, you'll find these drugs. Um, you have to go to a judge. Now, you know, the thing is, it's so funny when I watch things like uh, British shows like um, set in <laughs> East, L- East London, like Top Boy, and they say feds. You don't really have feds in, in, the, in Ireland, but that's become the slang from American movies, right? But yeah. when the local law enforcement, it could be the NYPD, it could be state, you could beat those cases. The feds, when they say the feds, when the U.S. government, which is Homeland Security, DEA, FBI, comes for you like they did for El Chapo, they have a 90, good luck going to trial because they have a 99.9% or something like that. Ninety, You barely ever can beat it at, the only guy that I think beat the feds at trial that I can think of was John Gotti, but they fixed the jury. 
And then they eventually did get them. So they they don't come for you until they've it's it's sign seal delivered. Like they've got the case. It's just a question now of um what is the case? I mean, is what it is really the case? Sp- exactly what they have on them and um he's not been charged. You know, I mean, right now we're we're talking about a guy that we have to keep saying alleged. Like there's yes. no there is no allegation that I know of that's he has put him in handcuffs. I mean, are they gathering um are they just evidence gathering the evidence? To the raids? And you know, what and, would happen sort of, you know, going forward, worst case scenario for him is that he will face charges of uh, trafficking of, you know, drugging and threatening people and whatever else has been alleged in these filings. But with that one billion that Forbes say he's worth, like what happened to the wealth of Weinstein, the wealth of Epstein? Is there assets recovery that goes for them? Is there, you know... It, does any of the money get paid over to the victims well, as part of settlements? Or yeah, I could see that happening. I mean, the thing, the thing with El Chapo was that was Ill, uh, you had no, there was all ill-gotten gains, right? He sold back his interest in Ciroc to the uh, forget the name of the company. I'm blanking out, but in Europe, uh, is it, um, it was Diageo, was it? Yeah, Diageo. Yeah, yeah. So. He, aren't they involved with Guinness as well? I mean, they're, it's yeah, a huge. They, they you know, bought so, Guinness. It's a huge big company. Yeah. Yeah. So he sold that back at a huge. So this is can't seize that money. That that's not illegal. Um, but if they find evidence of, sounds like there's quite a bit of drugs. Um, he's known to like guns, but that by itself isn't. I think a pattern of sexual trafficking would be a very very. Uh, also, how do you get that stain off your name? You know, and when I think about this, like if you and I had had this conversation 10 years ago, I would have said, you know, these guys get away. But he doesn't have the same stature in Ireland or or, or anywhere in Europe. But Bill Cosby, for Americans of a certain generation, Bill Cosby was America's dad. He was the most beloved. You, We didn't miss it Thursday. You sat down. The idea that he would go to prison for drugging. I thought he was almost I think he was close to a billionaire because that show was huge. So anything is possible. I mean, first of all, what do you really like? I remember my my wife at the time. We all love Bill Cosby. He came, he came and gave the uh, uh, commencement address at Columbia University, and he was just he's an educator. No one could believe this guy was. A, I, I grew and, up watching Different Strokes. Yeah, but just remember, remember, and he it was like going back to the sixties. He'd been roofing. He'd been put, mm-hmm. and he's like nobody talked about it, right? So, you know, when people say that, how could that be? I'm like. We see a sliver of this person's life for 30 minutes on our little box in our in our living room. What do you know they really like? And I, I, I so if people think, oh, why would did he do this? What do you know? What do you know about what he does in his private life? It sure sounds like he's got some kinks. That's that's for sure. And I, I uh, get yeah. a sense from you, Douglas, that um, you, you found it difficult over the course of your career and you know working with a lot of these guys and and you know on their stories and stuff. You found it difficult to find people with good to say about Diddy. You know, he doesn't seem to be that popular a personality when you're actually. Uh, there's a, there's a few people. Celebrity. Well, there's a few of his generation that are coming out and saying, but it's more cultural solidarity. Like, hey, black folks, why are we so quick to jump down? Like presumed, you know, innocent, et cetera, et cetera. A few are saying that. But there is that, you know, that German, Germans have those words for everything, Schadenfreude, the joy in, the Germans actually have a word, Schadenfreude, the joy in seeing another person suffer. (laughs) There is a great degree of Schadenfreude of people looking, but that guy was a bastard. That guy was so arrogant, jumping up in the Mm -hmm. videos, acting like he could rap. And so there's a lot of people who are uh, gazing at this train wreck with you know oh tisk tisk but it's real glee uh but you know there have been i think i i turned you on to the the youtube is gene deal who was his his mm-hmm. right hand man a, and a former cop or, or a former um you see a lot of what these guys do is they're smart enough to put security guys around them that are law enforcement or former so they you know if something comes they can maybe make it skate away but this guy has got a whole youtube channel exposing all kinds of stuff that he says Puffy was involved in. And if this guy had, you know, you could say, well, P. 
people are trying to make a buck here and there off someone's name. No, he sounds he sounds like a nice guy. I was watching actually before I even was was coming on to talk to you. I was watching a podcast he had done, and you know he's flogging a book or whatever. But he has done a lot of work in the background and community work. He's worked with a lot of kind of impoverished kids. I'd say he's a good sort of moral code. That guy. Yeah, and you know I don't think. Every single one of these accusations can be a lie. It's possible, but there's no scenario in which there's collusion or that there's getting the story straight. It's too, I'm sure if I was an investigator and you are practically, you are like a cop in the way you think because you do so much of this stuff. If so many people have so many diverse, and the, and there's a thread to it. Oh, sex workers or um, voyeuristically making my girlfriend. If so many people say these things and they're independent of each other, <laughs> you, you tend to think there's some there's some truth to the allegations. He, he may he may not go to prison. I don't know. I have no idea if he could beat this case. Um, he's certainly going to settle a lot of, like you said, he'll settle be what he can presumably. But I mean, he just it, it just looks for the moment, and he will proclaim his innocence. And as we say, he hasn't been charged with anything, hasn't been found guilty of anything. But there's a lot coming at him, and it feels very like what we've seen before with the end of other careers in the uh, entertainment industry. It just feels like I, the same thing is happening again. Regar- I almost feel regardless of what the outcome of the federal case, whether he's a, on trial or goes to prison, I can't imagine his career recovery. In, in any sense of, I mean, he's become, if you really go into the hip hop stuff, like a laughing stock. You know, one of the things that Gene Deal said is, when you get to this, it's not like he's bisexual. He said, when you get to this level of um, empowerment, he said it almost like it was like Roman orgies. Sexuality wasn't really part of it. It was like everybody partook of everything. So, and that, and, and hip hop is still extremely homophobic. So I can't see him getting getting his name back to, to what it was, but, you know, stranger things have happened in the world. But, you know, I it, I think it's not that he's, old enough to outgrown it is that he was shaped by this pre me too culture and this pre mm-hmm. um, to think I'm all powerful. Yeah. And I think, I think that power is a very, that level of power must be so intoxicating. I mean, you dealt with the kind of hands and this, you know, with gangsters, the same thing. Like, who are you going to, who are you, you know, shoot somebody in front of a million witnesses. Who's going to talk about me? You know, who, who, who has the nerve? It's that must be almost the, the, the animating, uh, factor. Well, why do you do it? Like I actually said to remember the Andrew Hogan who brought down El Chapo. I said, well, once you've got that much money, why do you, it's cause it's the only thing he knows how to do. And he loves it. He loves the power. Like you don't retire to like, you know, St. Bart's, you don't retire to the Virgin islands as a billionaire. You just be like it. You like controlling people. Mm-hmm. So I don't, I don't see this uh, as being a, a matter of, of course it's sexual abuse or whatever. It's just, it is a, a power, uh, an egomaniac with a power fixation. Uh-huh. Finally, Doug, what is his current name? Is this, did well, he he's going by Sean brother. Combs? Well, he's, his name is Sean Combs. Yeah. Sean. Sean. I can't just call him but, Sean. It'd be much easier. Yeah. Well, it was Sean John. So he was Sean Combs. When I came to New York, I said it. So Puff, I always thought it was because he smoked weed. Apparently, he used to get so mad that they called him like he would huff and puff. So he was Puff Daddy. And uh, they used to be these big parties. Puff Daddy, you know, it was called Daddy's House, these hip hop parties. There was always some kind of violence there. I stopped going on Thursday nights at this club called the Red Zone. So people that were in New York remember him just kind of as a party promoter. Uh, and then after the J-Lo shooting, he rebanded himself as P. Diddy and then just Diddy. And then I yeah, recently heard he's brother love. But when these allegations came out, I think everybody's taking that in a different way now. And it's sort yeah. of like... Be so I, to stick to Sean, I think, would he? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, there was a period, you know, really, I'm thinking back around 1999, 2000, where if you heard Puff Daddy was at a party, like I was starstruck seeing him with Jennifer Lopez. It was, I mean, not starstruck, but I mean, it was, uh, well, Prince was more interesting to me because I just thought Prince is a musical genius. But just seeing those kind of power couples, you know, when you saw those people dating, you know, it really was. And that story, I have to tell you. So I'm in this banquette with these, some of the biggest 
celebrities you've ever seen. Mike Tyson walks in. And now, of course, I had now have to go to the bathroom. But I have to go through three different velvet ropes to get out of this. It's it's this upper level of a nightclub. And I've left behind. And every person who's not in the ropes is straining to see what's going on in there. And as I'm, I was, I said to the bouncer guy, I said, are you going to let me back in? Because I'm nobody. I got to get back into that. Table. <laughs> and I remember people going, well, man, imagine what they're saying. And I remember saying to somebody, they're not saying anything. Like it was just the most banal, like nothing, nothing was going on. But there was this gravitational pull that people just wanted, like they are superstars, almost yeah. like the Royals. It's, it's, but when you see it up close, there's nothing there. It was the same mundane, bullshit, boring conversations that you would imagine anybody having. There was now Prince was interesting because he spoke in kind of weirdly religious. He said, to, you know, he was talking to me about Cleopatra and Nefertiti. Like he just said these things. But I, as far as I remember listening to Pop Daddy and J-Lo. Oh, yeah. I quoted her in the article that I wrote. The crowd was getting so intense. And it was bought like there was supposed to be security all around us. But this was now this banquet full of celebrities. And Puff Daddy wasn't really protecting her. And J-Lo says, well, they're about to see the ghetto come out in me. Like, like she was going to start smacking you because she was they were like stepping on her shoe or whatever. It was just. But yeah, there was there. There was a period where just to be around that kind of power couple or to see that level of celebrity intoxicated people. And I think social media has de- demystified it. It really has. Like, I don't see that there's too many people, you know, all the footballers, you know, I idolize Pele, Maradon. They all, they put their Instagram, you know what they're doing and how they, how they lace up their boots. There's no mystery to anybody's celebrity life anymore. Right? Oh, I think Except, it's still there. I think we've just got too old to be in the past. Well, unless there's a secret, like Kate, Maybe I'm what happened? Like, what was Kate's, you know, health problem with, you know, like there, but with a lot of these people that we used to, I mean, I used to just imagine what would Paul, what would a conversation with Paul McCartney be like? Well, now he does podcasts and he explains like, yeah, this is how I wrote the song. You know, we all know everything now. So I don't know how these guys who thought they could get away with murder. Well, not murder, sexual trafficking and thought they could get away with it in this age when everything is being recorded mm. and everybody's snooping around and people have podcasts to talk about them like we're doing now. <laughs> well, the world changed, didn't it? And I'll tell you what. Uh, Jennifer Lopez had a lucky escape in that one. She knew. I think she knew. And I'm glad she's Ben Affleck seems to have been her her one. But, you know, like she didn't it never see. I'm glad she split yeah. up with Sean. Yeah, Sean. Yeah. I don't know. Is, he pop- is, it, is, it, is, is his music popular in Ireland at all? I mean, he is this sort of, you know, celebrity, big celebrity from the US, from all that rap world. And I think that well, certainly maybe I'm just a freak, but when I saw the Homeland Security landing in on his properties and, and the headlines coming out of that, I just thought, wow, this is, there's obviously some big, huge story that has been going on in the background here. I sort of find it yeah. interesting when celeb- that celebrity bubble eventually pops and, you know, the likes of what you're talking about in that nightclub that night, people desperately trying to get close to Jennifer Lopez. And uh, to try and hear what they were saying when ultimately they were saying absolutely nothing of interest. So, you know, there is this whole sort of uh, thing around celebrity. And then I think when behind the surface, there's all this, or certainly allegations in this case, um, of a lot of really bad, dark things going on. And everything can change in in an instant. And it looked to me like that's what happened for him. I think it was probably an instant that took 15 years to come, right? Like it was, it was, it seems like now people are saying everybody knew. I mean, everybody knew that there were these, you went to a Puff Daddy party and there was a, a, you you didn't go out of the third floor. So I don't know how people keep secrets that long unless they're, you know, but except the the higher the get, I suppose, the, 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 the longer the fall to earth. And that's what it feels like with him. Um, Right, well, look, we shall talk again. I suspect that in the next two weeks, more things will happen. So maybe we'll have an update. Douglas, thanks for coming on. Thank you, as always, for having me. You've been listening to Crime World, a podcast from sundayworld.com, produced by Ian Mullaney and edited by me, Nicola Talent. Research assistant is Claude Amini. If you like this show and love true crime, leave us a review. Or why not download the free sundayworld.com app for lots more stories from Ireland, and across the globe.